Would you please welcome our Toastmaster for the evening, our Roastmaster for the evening, Mr. Milton Burrow, please. Thank you, Johnny. And uh, that fat son of a bitch, where's he? Tonight, gentlemen, tonight we are gathered here for two reasons. The first one is to offer recognition to a unique and outstanding comedian, and the other reason is to get out of the house away from our fucking loved ones. <laughs> A little louder, please. <laughs> Gentlemen, if the saying is true, you are what you eat, tonight we are honoring the biggest cunt in show business. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong, nothing. There's a switch, I can't get it down. <laughs> uh, there is nothing... There is nothing wrong tonight or any time saying the word cunt because if it wasn't meant to be eaten, God wouldn't have created it in the form of a taco. Just, just a year ago, a year ago, you honored me. And believe me, sincerely, when I left here, I went home full of emotion and deeply appreciative of the occasion. Tonight, gentlemen, following your great tradition of paying tribute the giants of show business, you're honoring red buttons. And all I can say, all I can say about that is, take back your fucking plaque. Good night. No, 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 I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm thrilled to be, I haven't been so thrilled since I let the Golden Girls sit on my face. No, I got that wrong, since I let the golden girl shit on my face. That's what I did. I say, gentlemen, naming red buttons the man of the year is like naming Roseanne Barr the fuck of the month. This evening... This evening, gentlemen, is dedicated... dedicated to the proposition that the continuous mention of the word fuck will remind my prick of what it once used to do. <laughs> Red, my darling, let me warn you tonight, you're in for major catastrophe. Many vicious things will be said about you from these comics. Some, some will call you a total prick. Someone will say that you're a cheap bastard. Some will say you're a freaky fucking fakeler. And then there are others who will lie about you. <laughs> Gentlemen, for years, this man, Red Buttons, has been the center of a big controversy here at the Guardians. Half of the members think he's a big schmuck, and the other half thinks he's an asshole. But I don't agree with either side. I think he's both. <laughs> this man we are honoring tonight has screwed more people in the ass than Richard Simmons on a slow weekend. <laughs> but he's got guts, this man. It's the only man in Hollywood 
Whoever told Shelly Winters he had a headache. I heard that years ago, Red kept bugging Ken Weinberg to make him a member of the Guardians. He kept begging and begging. And finally, Ken said, no way, Red, no way. We've already got one cocksucker in the club already. And Red said, yeah, but suppose he gets sick. Before I go any further, gentlemen, I must tell you, and I'm going to tell him, Red, what happened during dinner. This yutz over here bent over to me and whispered, and he said, Milton, I just found a new way to fuck. I said, no shit. He said, well, a little. <laughs> Not the brightest guy in the world. Not. If he fell into a barrel of tits, he'd come up sucking his thumb. This man is the only man I know who went to Mexico and came home constipated. You. And Red, congratulations, sincerely. How do you like this great array of speakers they got for you? They look like the fucking cast of Cocoon. <laughs> Looks like a convention of used pussy salesmen. Motley group. I mean, they look like they all fucked Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> Recently. Um, to you gentlemen out there, I guess you must be wondering how we allot the time for our speakers to speak. Well, here's exactly how it works. If you've, uh, how shall I put this, if you've got a cock four inches long, you do four minutes. If it's five inches long, five minutes. Six inches long, six minutes. Most of this day is, will only bow. <laughs> Balls don't count. Now let's get to red. Let's talk about our guest of honor. The first time gentleman I met red was 55 years ago on Southern Boulevard in the Bronx and at that time he was fucking my cousin <laughs> and I didn't even know he knew Irving <laughs> as soon <laughs> I'm laughing because I know the next joke As soon as he saw me on Southern Boulevard, now this is the truth, don't lie, he, he looked at me and said, Milton Burrow, Milton Burrow, you're my idol. Then he bent down and kissed my ring, because I was scratching my balls at the time. <laughs> Ten minutes later, he was scratching his. This man has been a real true friend to me. A true friend. Of course, you all know what a true friend is. That's a guy who will go out and get two bro jobs, then come home and give you one. <laughs> then they, uh... <laughs> you bald-headed prick. Now, the next time, next time I met Red Buttons here, Aaron Schwartz, I met him, it was backstage at the Gaiety Burlesque Theater on Broadway. Uh, in those days, he uh, didn't have red hair. His hair was black and curly. Of course, he was going down on Pearl Bailey at the time. And while, while he was pressing her and eating her, he turned to me and said, Christ, Milton, this tastes like shit. And Pearl yelled, schmuck, turn me over. In those days, 
In those days in Burles, Rez, Red, you, you must you must agree with me because you weren't too popular with the strip teasers. I remember this because one time this Jew midget here walked over to a six foot beauty and looked up at her and said, what do you say to a little fuck? <laughs> she said, hello, little fuck. <laughs> Gentlemen, I'll never forget when Red wanted to get out of burlesque and get into the big time, I tried to help him, so I took him to the William Morris Agency here, it was a great agency, great agents, every Tuesday they say to each other, have a nice weekend. <laughs> but I took he wanted to be a star, so I'm from Burlesque, so I took him over there for a job, and we walked into this office, and the agent said, a uh, young man, what do you do? And Red said, what do I do? I'm the only guy in the world who can fart the Star Spangled Banner. The agent said, terrific, let's see you do it. So Red pulled down his pants and his shorts and proceeded to crap all over the carpet, the chairs, the desk. The whole room was a mess. The agent jumped up and screamed. He said, what the fuck are you doing? And Red said, first I gotta clear my throat, don't I? See, <laughs> not here. I'm not going to do this one. I'm saving this for a big dinner. <laughs> now let's talk about Red's sex life. It won't take long. He may not look it right now, but I know this man pretty well. He's one of the most horniest guys I ever met. One night, he was getting ready to fuck the hunchback. <laughs> and she didn't show up. <laughs> and was murdered because he had the hole dug and everything. <laughs> horny man. <laughs> Fucking horny. A few years ago, he was walking out of Nate Nails and a hooker accosted him. She said to him, would you like to get laid? And Red said, there are three reasons why I can't. She said, what are they? He said, well, the first reason is I have no money on me. She said, stick the other two reasons up your ass. <laughs> All he ever talks about is humping and humping. While we were having dinner, he told me this joke about Jensen, so I wrote it down. The other day, this is the joke he told me, two nuns ran into two muggers in Griffith Park, and the guys were raping them. And one of the nuns said, forgive him, Father. He knows not what he's doing. And the other nun said, Mine does. <laughs> Kink, kinky is bastard. He, all he wants to do is fuck. It's all on, on his mind. And it can be awfully embarrassing for him, because as I told you before, he farts a lot. He has a terrible gas problem. And finally, he went to his doctor, pleading for help. And in the doctor's office, he couldn't stop farting. <laughs> Futzing all of it. The doctor excused himself and came back carrying a 10-foot pole with an iron hook on it. And Red jumped up and screamed, Doc, what the hell are you going to do to me? Doctor said, nothing, but I got to open these fucking windows, don't I? <laughs> now let's say, let's say something nice about Red Buttons. During the World War, World War II, Red wanted to serve his country so he joined the army and entered the cast of that famous army show, Wing Victory. When the show played in the naval base in San Diego, Red, as doing a shtick as a gag, put on a sailor's uniform and went out cruising the streets in search of pussy. He grabbed the first hooker he saw and he took her to a motel. And he told us not give that he was an admiral. While he was on top of her, he said, how am I doing, baby? She said, Admiral, you're doing three knots. You're not hard, you're not in, you're not getting your fucking money back. <laughs> you know, before I close this monologue, there's one thing that I cannot understand 
uh, about it. For a guy as horny as red, he sure gets a lot of mileage out of that pygmy putz of his. Did you ever see it? His joint looks like a cunt with a pinky sticking out of it. <laughs> if, he, if he ever got a real hard on and walked into a wall, he'd break his nose. If you knew somebody, you'd be sitting here. I'm kidding. <laughs> Go to hell. Now, with, uh, unlike me, with the size of my joint, I'll never need a cane. But in spite, in spite of Red's puny pecker, Red always did well with the chicks. He loved to play the field, and he finally ended up marrying a shiksa. You see, he was tired of schooling inanimate objects, Jew Jewish women. Red, as you know, I must tell everything, is married to a beautiful Puerto Rican gal. It was easier than picking her up at the bus every Tuesday. <laughs> I told you you're going to get it tonight. His wife's name, she's a wonderful girl, she's Puerto Rican, is Alicia, the hell of a woman, and she's even hornier than red. Alicia loves to have sex every morning with red. It gives her a chance to time her eggs. Of course, you know, red hasn't done uh, many movies lately, and he's getting a little worried about the uh, loot, about the money. So the other day he told Alicia, he said, you better learn to cook so we can fire the housekeeper. And she said, Red, you better learn to fuck so we can get rid of the gardener. <laughs> you know, I fall, oh no, oh no. What? That's the son yelling? <laughs> Sorry, Adam. <laughs> Holy Christ. You know, I have followed their romance from the start. Now, his son is sitting out there, Adam, and he's, I'm talking about his lovely mother, Alicia. Adam, you're 51, and you should listen to this. <laughs> How their romance started, they first met in New York, in the balcony of Low State Theater. He didn't know her, she didn't know him. And he started to fool around. Put his hand on her leg, and she didn't say anything. Put his hand on her dress, she didn't say anything. And he put his finger up her snatch. And she said, can you do me a favor? Can you please put another finger in there? And he said, why? She said, because I want to whistle for the fucking manager. This, this is the last one. This I gotta tell you. Now this is the truth. If I'm, if I'm lying about this one, I should drop dead in this spot. <laughs> this is the true story. Before Red married Alicia, this is the secret you told me. He was having an affair with a married woman. And her husband came home early and found Red fucking his wife in bed. The husband grabbed Red by the neck, pulled him into the garage, dragged him over to a vice, took Red's cock out, and stuck it into the vice and began to tighten the vice tighter and tighter. Then he took a knife and held it over Red's cock. Red yelled, wait a minute. Are you going to cut my cock off? The guy said, no. I'm going to set the fire to the garage. You're going to cut your cock off. <laughs> That's the end of the shit that I opened with. Okay, thank you very much. Now, 
gentlemen, on with our fantastic frolic of filth and fornication. And gentlemen, it is not the duty of a master of ceremonies. You'll get your shot. It is not the duty of the master of ceremonies to bore you, but to introduce those who will. I'm putting you on, I'm kidding. Before I introduce our first guest from the dais, I glanced out front just now, and I, I saw a mirage, which will go out of business pretty soon. I saw a dear enemy, a friend of mine, that I haven't seen since, oh, last night. And I don't know why he's sitting in the audience, he should be up here in the dais, but he's a beautiful man. I love him, he loves me. Won't get a divorce. One of the great, great, and I use it very profoundly, great actors of all time, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sidney Portier. How did you get a table in front? <laughs> Love you, Sydney. <laughs> you know, gentlemen, when you mention the names Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly, there's only one other name that can compare with them. And it's our first speaker, our first star, a fantastic dancer, a wonderful actor and a comedian, and most of all, one of the greatest all-round entertainers in the business. I'm crazy about him, I love him. Gentlemen, Donald O'Connor. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here tonight, Red. Really is. And thank you, Milton, for that wonderful introduction. I might introduce Buddy Freed over here is at the piano. How you doing, Buddy? <clears throat> well, we got together. Sid Culler wrote a little something for you tonight. You know, I've known Red, I think, perhaps longer than anybody here. I know how Red got his name. Um, as a child, he was just a little kid. When they first sent him to school, he was, um, you couldn't distinguish him from the other kids. He would just get lost in the crowd. There was nothing about him that would stand out very much like today and so he was always getting lost so what happened his mother his mother sewed uh, on his clothes so they could find him right away they sewed little red buttons all over his clothes and that's how they he got his name red buttons ever since he was a little baby and red now you know why i'm always uh, asked to come to these rows because i'm not a threat uh, We'll do this little thing. Oh, well, first of all, I gotta put on my glasses. Oh, but honestly, before I do this, then I wanna sit down. <clears throat> the great thing about you, Red, is that um, I, every time I see you, I smile inside. I really do. I've watched you with other people and the kind of guy you are. So now with this little song, Red, by now I presume you've learned that when you start a roast, you're bound to get burned. You are vilified and comic shit on you. You're a lamb being led to the slaughter. But I'd like to lay some wit on you with apologies to Cole Porter. You're a flop and you're off your rocker. You're a flop. You're an alter cocker. And your bridge falls out when you give a girl a kiss. You're a hopeless bum. You cannot come. Instead, you piss. <laughs> Not my image, is it? <laughs> you're a wimp. And your fame is dimming. You're a shrimp. You go up on women. <laughs> when you get a blowjob, you go into shock. When you fuck, you fade. Try getting laid with Milton's cock. 
you can't boast that tonight's a winner. It's a roast. You can't rate a dinner. And to honor you proves the guardians are insane. You're their second bet, cause they couldn't get Saddam Hussein. It's a fact that there's no denying that your act like your hair keeps dying. You flop since you copped the Academy Award. You're a klutz of putts. In fact, you leave me bored. Red, you suck. And the truth perchance is you're a schmuck. You are Johnny Francis. <laughs> when you try to say you disgrace the vocal art, and I must propound, I have a better sound each time I fart. You're a runt, you're a fading rajah. To be blunt, you're a cunt like Jaja. Please forgive me, Red, for the roasting and the flop. Though tonight we hit the bottom, you're the top. Thank you, Red. Terrific, terrific. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. But ladies, I'm right. There he is, the boy actor, singing those dirty songs. But you did it all in good taste. Donald, I was just thinking while I was sitting there, you Irish and we Jews have comedy all wrapped up. You got Eddie Murphy and we got Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> I remember when you drank, but you don't drink anymore. Well, I don't drink at all. Jews, Jews don't drink. Because it interferes with their suffering. <laughs> Our next... What the hell I'm saying? Absolutely wonderful. I mean that, Buddy Freed, you were bad. No, you were wonderful. And Sid Color, well, I don't know where Sid Color's sitting, but he deserves a great hand for those lyrics. I'll be doing them next week. Our next speaker, the man that's sitting next to me, Jan Murray, to me is one of the funniest comedians in the business. He's currently working on a new movie called Leave It, It's Beaver. <laughs> it was Jan Murray who was responsible for the gem of biblical humor. Quote, he's responsible for this quote from the Bible. In the immortal words of Abraham, who said to God, now God, let me get this straight. They get to keep the land and the oil, and we get to cut off the tips of our what? <laughs> Gentlemen, here's a funny man, my pal and Red's buddy, Jan Murray. Thank you, Milton. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> God bless you. He's turned senility into an art form. <laughs> we, uh... <laughs> Good evening, members of the dais, the guest of honor, Jews. Uh, I, I have a confession to make. I'm going to get it out of the way fast. I'm completely unprepared tonight. I, uh... I got all screwed up. First of all, I had no idea this was going to be a stag, so I didn't prepare the proper material. And second of all, I thought we were honoring Red Skelton. <laughs> Don't forget it's a stag. I mean, when I'm invited to a dinner sponsored by the Guardians of the Jewish Home for the Aging, I certainly didn't expect to see all men in a stag affair. And then to hear some of the language used here tonight it was to me unbelievable. So uh, I thought maybe if I was in the wrong place, I sneaked out and called the Jewish Home for the Aging, and they told me to fuck off. <laughs> so, 
So as I say, I'm not prepared for this type of evening. The jokes I brought with me are all for mixed audiences. I mean, type of stories I tell in front of men and women. I get screams here. I'll get the shit knocked out of me or booed. Uh, for instance, I, I, I ch I'll show you what I mean, you know, when you see a comedian is in, is in trouble. Here's a cute little gag like I do in my act, you know, when I work for money in front of men and women. Uh, I, I say like this, uh, I suddenly moved a couple checked in the hotel. I got undressed, got into bed. He turned to her and said, tell me, darling, am I the first one? And she said, why do all you guys keep asking me that same question? <laughs> now, you see, when I do that in a mixed audience, I, it's a big laugh. They did pretty good here. Uh, <laughs> but really, at a stag, you have to be a little more pointed. Like at a stag, if you want to do a honeymoon joke, you do it this way. You say, honeymoon couple checked in the hotel. They got undressed. She looked at her husband and said, oh, look at that wee-wee. And he started to chuckle. He said, darling, you're a married woman now. You don't have to refer to this as a wee-wee anymore. This is a prick. She said, oh, no, I've seen pricks. That's a wee-wee. <laughs> so you see the difference of the material. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like in my act, when I work for a mixed audience, I, uh, I guess the naughtiest I get, sometimes I'll use the word ass. That's about as rough as I get. Like one of my big jokes, uh, this for a mixed audience you won't enjoy it, but I just got to show it to you. Although here's a guy writing them all down anyway. Look at this guy. It's fast as I'm talking, he's writing. Uh, it's this uh, homosexual, two homosexuals are driving in their car, a sports car, top down there, having, enjoying the trip. You know, and all of a sudden this big truck pulls in front of them and cuts them off. The guy puts his foot on a brake, he stumps just about an inch in front of that truck. If he hit that truck, they'd have both been dead. He was so irate, he jumped out of his car. He ran over the truck, looked up at the driver, he said, you moron, you stupid moron. You cut me off, you could have killed me. I'm gonna sue you. Truck driver stuck his head out of the cab, he says, kiss my ass. He went back and said to his friend, he wants to settle out of court. <laughs> Now at a stag, we would do a homosexual joke, something like this, a doctor says to the patient, you're gay, aren't you? He said, yes, I am. He said, anyone else in your family gay? He said, yes, my father's gay, my grandfather's gay, my two brothers are gay. I says, good grief, doesn't anyone in your family eat pussy? He said, yes, my sister. <laughs> so, So anyway, speaking of pussy, reminds me I'm here to roast red tonight. And uh, I was just trying to show you the, the, the problems we have. But I, I'll tell you, uh, even though I'm, I'm totally unprepared with stag material, I'm not unprepared to talk about red. Now, you know, uh, one or two of the people, we already had two people on, they both claimed long friendships with red, and it's true. He does know everybody on his days for years. But I will safely say without contradiction that I know Red longer than anybody on this dais. I do. And, uh, and what I'm going to tell you is truth, not made up shit. Like you've heard so far tonight. But you look, well, hey, listen, let's be on you're going to hear. But we're all comedians up here. When we roast a guy, we make up jokes about him. Truth or not truth is unimportant. The important thing is to get a laugh. So if we have a joke, whether it fits him or not, we say it. Like last time we roasted Red, what, eight, nine years ago, Red, some schmuck got up. He started talking about Red's cock, which again today they talk. No one's ever seen it, no one knows, you know, but these, uh, they do jokes. It's, it's made up jokes. Like this schmuck got up, he said, Red's cock is so big, it's got its own heart and lungs. Now, you know that's a made up joke. He doesn't even have his own heart and lungs. Look at the size of him. The truth is, I know. Milton almost had it right when he talked about red small dick. He could fuck a Cheerio red. <laughs> and I think he did a few times. So anything I tell you is the truth. We have spent a lifetime together. We are the same age. We were born and brought up in the same neighborhood in the Bronx. We went to school together. We started in the Catskills together. We started in burlesque together in nightclubs. We even started our motion pictures career at the same time. And from the very beginning, Red got very lucky. You see, the great John Wayne accidentally met Red one day and took a liking to him. And the first thing he did, he got him apart. 
in that classic picture, The Longest Day. Remember that? When, uh, when Red was in that picture, he was wonderful in it. Well, John Wayne got him the part, because John was just crazy about him. He used to carry him around in his pants pocket for luck. <laughs> Which at the time was a big step up for Red, because in the picture before that, he was Glenn Ford's suppository. <laughs> so, so, I mean, compared to Glenn Ford's ass, John Wayne's pocket was paradise. But now that he made that picture, Red was on the way and there was no stopping him. Eventually, he went to Japan and made a picture called Sayonara. And at the same time, I went to Africa and made a picture called Tarzan and the Great River. For his performance in Sayonara, Red came home with an Oscar. And for my work in Tarzan and the Great River, I came home with dysentery. I didn't stop shitting in one steady stream until 1982. So I, re I reiterate, I do know Aaron Schwack longer than anyone. I was the one who told Milton that's Red's real name. I mean, what'd you think? <laughs> I also told him all these things that I had to put in my pocket. <laughs> Fighting for my fucking life after this, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> no, Schwack, Aaron Schwack. Like, what'd you think his father's name was Buttons? Believe me, no one in Bialystok was running around with the name Buttons. Not a very popular name in Europe. You ever hear of Czar Buttons? Attila the Button? Genghis Buttons? No such fucking name. It's not a hot name in Europe. Schwat, that was the real family name. In fact, when my father first met Little Red, he saw this pale little red-headed kid, he went into shock. Because for months he used to hear me say, I'm going to the Schwarzers for dinner. <laughs> Even as a kid, you could see Red was different, a little off center. He was different from all the other kids. Even back then he used to eat oat bran. This was in 1924. I say what I mean when I say he's different. The first day he went to school, he came home. And his mother said, no, right there, how did it go in school today? He said, Mama was terrific. The teacher asked the question. I was the only one in the whole class that could answer. She said, oh, yeah, the cup. I'm so proud of you. What was the question the teacher asked? <laughs> Red said, she asked, who fought it? <laughs> so, you know, he's a little off center. You know what I mean? He's not a normal kid. And speaking of schools, incidentally, I'm here to tell you that the mere fact Red and I are here tonight is a miracle. Because we went to the roughest, toughest school in the roughest, toughest fucking neighborhood in New York City. PS 75 in the Bronx. The P stood for parole. There was a mortuary on every floor. Our homecoming queen was named Nunzio. <laughs> Who's gonna vote against him? Six foot four, 280 pounds, no hair on his chest. He had twigs. He used to smoke in bed, face down. <laughs> Tough cocksucker. He was the captain of our bowling team because he bowled overhand. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes red night with the pins. And this fucking monster screwed everything he could lay his hands on. One day he was screwing an 80 year old woman. In the middle of the hump, she died. A policeman ran over and said, what happened? Nunzio said, I don't know. I came and she went. <laughs> this was some neighborhood for two little Jewish kids to grow up in. We didn't fight and we didn't fuck. We didn't do anything that started with F. Except that he fought it. Because he thought it started with a PH. <laughs> You know, what's really amazing about Red and his life, that with all the humping and pumping and sucking and fucking that always went on around him and our neighborhood, Red remained a complete sexual innocent. He was beyond innocent. He was a putz. Until he was 17 years old, he thought black men were known for their big tits. <laughs> when he was 18, he discovered his dick. Before long, it became an obsession with him. He used to stare at it by the hour. He was completely fascinated by it, especially the head, which he thought was the greatest invention he ever saw because it kept his hand from slipping off. <laughs> At the age of 20, Red and I were not only the two youngest top bananas in the history of burlesque, 
We were the only virgins in burlesque. Then one night, backstage at Minsky's Burlesque House on Broadway, we both lost our virginity at the same time with the same girl. It was at the weekly Wednesday night gangbang. You see, a show business gangbang is different from an ordinary gangbang. As in show business, we all try to get on last. There was no stopping right after that. No girl was safe around him. He tried to screw everything he saw. I remember once we uh, we went these two girls, we took them to the movies. Milton already told you my big joke on it, whistling for the manager. Here, it's in my pocket. This and about 20 others while this cocksucker was on. But uh, I got more in my pocket than I got on the restroom. Uh, <laughs> sitting upstairs in front of us with two little old ladies in the movie and one of them in the middle of the picture leaned over and said to a friend, my God, man, really can't believe this. <laughs> the man next to me is masturbating. She says, oh, good grief. Let's get out of here. She says, I can't. He's using my hand. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right, the big stuff is in the pocket. Red, all the biggies, whistling, whistling for, whistling for the manager in the pocket. <laughs> The other one read, what the hell, the other biggie, I got to try, oh yeah, you know, with the guy putting the cock in the vice, you know, and yeah, I'm going to give, 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 give you the knife and set the garage on fire, you bet, in the pocket. Uh, in fact, that was my closest. So anyway, all I'd like to say, Red, believe me, that 60 years ago, I never dreamed that I'd be at the Beverly Hills Hotel someday for the Jewish home for the aging helping out in my small way because you're helping out in a big way, lending your name, your talent, your reputation to be on this day so we can all set you, all gathered here to honor you when we were kids in the Bronx. Go figure this out. And honor you we do, a comedian, dramatic actor, monologist, after dinner speakers, and truthfully, one of my oldest and dearest friends whom I love. joke. How old are you? Christ, I got underwear older than you. Oh, shut up. Very, very funny. We always needed a sensational speaker like you. From now on, oh, by the way, those jokes that you were referring to that were yours yesterday, you said I did them before. You want to buy my book? It's, it, I got a book out. 10,000 jokes. That, all those jokes are in that book. This book is now in its 18th printing. The first 17 were blurred. So fuck you and your jokes. Thanks for your wonderful serious speech. I'm kidding, Jam. <laughs> you prick. No, I, I love him. I really do. And now I'd uh, like to go to sleep. <laughs> I'd like you to meet one of the finest actors in all show business. He began, he began as a child performer, then graduated to such hit TV series as I Remember Mama and Eight Is Not Enough. Right now, he's starring in a big hit called W.I.O.U. For a bow, one of my dearest friends, Dick Van Patten, gentlemen. Thank you, I never heard you funnier. <laughs> seated, seated next to uh, 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 Dick or Jim Van Patten is a, a very wonderful guy who uh, doesn't ever have to work anymore after appearing in this series that he appeared in for, the, for 10 consecutive years. Wonderful series. 
piece of shit. <laughs> they chopped it up and made, what, what's the joke? Banjo picks, come up with it. For a bow, he was the doctor in uh, that wonderful show. <laughs> Which is not on anymore because they don't have any more fucking cruises. Star of Love Boat, Bernie Capel. Praise <laughs> that. Mr. Lucky. <laughs> oh, fucking lucky guy you are. Get a series like that. Our next speaker is Pat Buttram. Now, Pat Buttram is a very wonderful comedian from the South who is best remembered as Gene Autry's sidekick in motion pictures. He has, he's on every morning on uh, KMPC, on uh, they're doing broadcasts for guys that bet on owls. <laughs> Great comedian. He's a country boy. He's with us tonight because as long as he's with us tonight, we know that the sheep are safe. <laughs> this country boy, not until the age of 16, did he think that horseshit was a dessert. And his biggest thrill today is to sprinkle salt on his ass and lie face down in a deer park. <laughs> the Will Rogers <laughs> of the day 11 set, gentlemen, the Shakespeare, the silo, and a hilarious guy, and a wonderful guy, Pat Buttram, the camera. God, when he introduces you with your own fucking jokes, you know. <laughs> it's mine, I got it out of your book. Yeah. Uh, what the hell can you say here? I don't know. As they say at MCA, the yin stops here. Yeah. Be nice. you, you, you've been to Mount Rushmore lately? Pat Morita's third from the left. I don't know what you say here. All this stuff, everything's been used. Every subject. No category one here about the red was finger fucking day 11. So I guess I can use the <laughs> only thing left to do. Uh, um, there's an announcement here, though. I did. I was listening to radio. They, they, they've cornered, they found uh, Saddam Hussein's hiding place. Closing in on him. Uh, they found it with a, uh, it's a new shit in the pants seeking missile. He's harder to get rid of than cat piss on a rug, you know? <laughs> Thought they'd catch him in a tank, but he won't get in a tank any more than Michael Dukakis will get in one. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, wanted to hear to go over real big, and uh, I do a lot of talks for the uh, for Jewish uh, organizations, and Milton has been helping me with a few uh, expressions that I could use and uh, so to see if I can 
Use one gray one here. A coctagoyum. That's and that means what does that mean, Milton again after that? Gentle Gentile. He's promised to help me get a brisk, whatever that is. Ed's got a, a fellow that's going to assist uh, in the ceremonies. Uh, got to see him. Uh, Rabbi Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> He's a big help. But... Red Buttons, a great guy that's, uh, I don't know they're talking about his sex life. Uh, I do know the only time he gets a hard on is when he drives over the reflector bumps on the freeway now. Uh, he had one great night. He, uh, he uh, fucked this girl uh, for an hour and three minutes. It was the night they set the clocks ahead an hour, you know. And, made it. Uh, and uh, but uh, I'll say this: Red is a great actor, great, and uh, he's never made a porno movie. You won't make one. Red will not watch a porno movie. He don't want to see anybody get more pussy in an hour than he's had in a whole damn lifetime. <laughs> now, he had a little trouble uh, now and then. Uh, a while back, uh, he had his foot was hurting, his toe swelled up, went into the doctor, and the doctor looked at it and said, my God, he said, you've got AIDS of the toe. So have you been associating with some homosexuals? And Red says, hell no, damn homosexuals. If I see those damn queers, I kick them in the ass. <laughs> uh, we did a picture together, Red, and uh, they had a little trouble on the set. You do sometimes try and keep it quiet. There's an actress accused this stuntman of raping her in the car, a limo. And so we had a kangaroo court and uh, to settle it right there. And they put the girl on the stand and said, what did he do? Tell us. She said, well, we're riding in the limo. It says he's driving. He grabs me, throws me in the back seat of the limo, grabs my right foot, puts it in that little strap hanging down by the right-hand window, grabs my left foot, puts it in that strap hanging down my left-hand window, Red leaned over to me and said, I've been driving a car 50 years. It's the first time I knew what those fucking straps were for. <laughs> but, but it's great to be here and all. And in this town, and a, a, and a day is full of comedians, and in this business we're in where nobody likes anybody, everybody loves Red Buttons. Thank you. He's got to leave. He's got to put makeup on his cock. So you uh, put on that hat. <laughs> hey, you look like a goy. Hey. <laughs> what are you stealing? Silverware? What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> he just... You're a wonderful Pat. But you forgot your best story, you schmuck. Ah, fuck it, I'll tell it. This is the best story. This, I took this from him, I swear. I swear. Didn't take anything from anybody else. Anyway, now I don't tell, I don't steal jokes. I just find them before they're lost. Now, Sam comes home, and Esther, his wife, says, Sam, I'm so glad you're home. I don't know what we're going to do with our son or anything. 12 years old, comes home from school, 
opens a magazine, the Playboy, and he starts with the playing with the the Patsala. He says, "You mean he's masturbating?" He says, "I don't know. It's masturbating a Mastercard. I don't know what the fuck he's doing." He says, "It's terrible." She says, "It's awful." She says, "You've got to make him stop doing that. It's sickening." He's where is he? He's upstairs. Sam goes upstairs. Sees the kid, opens the door, the kid's going away at it pretty good. He's whacking that pudding. Well. The father says, Set. I mean, stop immediately what you're doing. Stop it. You go blind. The kid says, I'm over here, Pop. <laughs> He's so. Our next speaker is a dear enemy of our guest of honor. His name is Dave Barry. And he wasn't sure that he could make it tonight. He was all shook up. Last week when he was working in Phoenix, he told me he committed sodomy with an ostrich. The police arrested him and took him to court. And Dave said, if I'd known you were going to make such a fuss about it, I'd have married the fucking bird. <laughs> Gentlemen, a great comedian, Mr. Dave Barry. Let's hear it. <laughs> I married the fucking bird. Thank you, Milton, and thank you for sending that sketch you go to pick me up at the airport. <laughs> I would like to say good evening to our audience, the guardians, and to our dearest, the home for the aging. And thank you, Milton. You are truly a great master of ceremonies, a terrific comedian, but from what I hear, a lousy hump. tells you everything. <laughs> it comes to finger fucking, he's the master, gentlemen. The only man who can walk into Nate and Al's order tongue and tell you whose it is. <laughs> I don't have any pockets, it's all right here. Milton Berle, already you've heard about his unusual endowment from Mother Nature. He happens to be the only man with a built-in Scud missile. And the only patriot who ever brought it down was Betsy Ross. Milton, are you feeling good, all right? Did you bring your cock with you tonight? He usually leaves it home in the microwave in case a broad shows up. Milton just signed to appear in the sequel to Dances with Wolves. It's called Yenses with Pigs. I like to tell one story about Milton. You know he's got a big cock, okay? Everybody knows that by now. Milton walked into a hula house, a hula house some years ago. He said, I'd like a girl. And the madam got a girl. They went upstairs. When he got undressed, the girl took one look at his schmuck and says, there's no way you're going to put that in me. Now get your clothes on and get the fuck out of here. He says, I don't want to put it in you. What do you want to do? I'll tell you how I get my kicks. We get undressed, we lie in bed, we turn the lights out, I turn the music on, I whisper sweet nothings in your ear, I caress you tenderly, and that's it. That's it? A hundred bucks? Okay, he paid her. They got undressed, went to bed, turned the music on, the lights out. He starts to caress her very tenderly, then he whispers sweet nothings in her ear. After about 15 minutes, she says to him, you know, I've turned a lot of tricks in my time, but never one like this. Nobody's ever taken the time or the trouble to treat me the way you have. You, sir, are a real gentleman. You must be from the South. <laughs> that's, that's the greatest compliment. Milton Boyle laughing at a joke he doesn't even get. 
there are too many good jokes left. I mean, new ones. They're all great. We love the oldies, but they're great. The story about a guy, he, he goes to a 20-year reunion of a college graduation, and he's mixing with the crowd in the ballroom. He spots this beautiful girl, walks up to her, he says, Charlotte, you remember me? She says, Larry, my old college sweetheart, you, you look terrific. He says, I look terrific. Charlotte, you haven't changed a bit in 20 years. You must be in perfect health. She says, as a matter of fact, I have bad news and good news. The bad news is, last week, they removed my cunt. The good news is, they found your class ring. <laughs> Anui, Anui. Guy goes to a doctor and he says, can you tattoo a hundred dollar bill on my prick? And why do you want a hundred dollar bill tattooed on your prick? The guy says, for three reasons. Number one, I like to handle my own money. Number two, I like to see my money grow. And number three, my wife can blow a hundred dollars quicker than anybody. <laughs> Enough of this sophisticated shit. It's nice to be here tonight, really honoring the Litvak Leprechaun. Better known as the last of the Red Hot Buttons. And God, Red, you look terrific. I mean that sincerely. I hope I look as well when I get to be your age. I can't tell you how old Red is, but he's somewhere between Tom Cruise and George Byrne. He's of the age where all the telephone numbers in his little black book are doctors. But he still has his hair. I look at it this way. The more hair you lose, the more head you get. The last time Red and I were together was at a meeting of premature ejaculators. The meeting ended early. I hope nobody else had that joke. There's going to be a lot of jokes in pockets today. He's a wonderful guy, Red. He has the personality of Mike Tyson, the humility of Don Rickles, and the integrity of Charles Keating. He has done for comedy what Ernest Borgnine did for aerobics. When Ed was a kid, he was so dumb he thought that offshore drilling was fucking a girl in a rowboat. He's Jewish on his mother's side and he's Irish by a friend on his father's side. I didn't know that was going to be that big. He actually came from a broken home his mother ran away with his father. He was an amazing child. At the age of two, he'd already memorized the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. But he couldn't talk, so nobody knew. Red never really wanted to be a big star, and it's working out real good. In contrast to Milton Berle's big cock, Red just willed his balls to a BB factory. He worked his way through law school as a freelance witness. There's a story about two lawyers walking down the street and a beautiful girl comes by and one lawyer says to the other, boy, would I like to fuck her. And the other one says, out of what? I can't tell you how rich Red Buttons is, but when E.F. Hutton talks, Red says, who gives a fuck? You have some gifts, Red, I want to announce from Buddy Hackett, a Scrabble game with four, 14 extra Fs. I have a package of corduroy condoms for groovy fucking. Quickly, skydiving lessons over Kuwait. We have a microwave fireplace for you. Now you'll be able to relax in your living room for an entire evening in only 20 minutes. We have another gift for you, Red. You've heard of Polaroid cameras. We're giving you a hemorrhoid. It takes shitty pictures, but any asshole can run it. You know something, with all this shit going on up here, gentlemen, let's face facts. This is the only escape we have from insanity at one of these roasts. The things that are going on in this world. 
a group of Germans. They want to rebuild the Berlin Wall so they can play handball. <laughs> Things are so bad in New York that the Mafia has had to lay off ten judges. <laughs> They're coming up with a new beer now with 7% less alcohol. It's great for people who don't want to get drunk but enjoy pissing. In Poland, they're drafting 50 and 60 year old men in the army, right out of high school. <laughs> insanity, gentlemen, insanity, the whole world. On Santa Monica Beach the other day, I had to take a piss. So I looked around, there was a clump of bushes and I was pissing in the bushes and the guy stuck his head out. Said, don't you know people are living here? This whole fucking Saddam Hussein business, I'm telling you, people are going crazy. I, I heard two guys discussing the subject. One got so nervous, he actually began to stutter. He said, you know what the other day, you know what the other day, you know what the other day, they're going to send all the American to be a bombers over there. Drop all the be bombers and knock them off the roof, 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 face of the earth, once and for all, once and for all, once and for all. The other guy said, well, it's easy for you to say. Hey, Red, I got some riddles for you. Here's a couple of riddles. When is a Mexican referred to as Spanish? When he becomes your son-in-law. <laughs> what do you call it when several cars driven by Jewish drivers are bumper to bumper? Whitlock. What's the definition of women's lip? That's when the wife says to the husband, tonight you sleep on a fucking wet spot. <laughs> Why can't you masturbate with these two fingers? Because they're mine. <laughs> when are four hands the busiest? When are four hands the busiest? That's when your dick slips out. Think about it. You know, there are a lot of celebrities that could have been here tonight, but because of commitments, either nightclubs, television, or motion pictures, they couldn't make it. And, uh, but they did send in a joke, Red. The Red Fox sent in a joke, and he asked me to read it. This woman walks into a carpet shop in Rodeo Drive, she bends over looking at the carpet and she farts. The salesman comes up and he says, Where do you hear the price? You'll shit. <laughs> I want to say something. I got a lot of jokes here, fellas, but it, it's such a pleasure to come out here and join in this evening like this. I especially want to thank the Guardians. Really, I know the great work that they do, and if I can find the name of the guy who wrote all my jokes here for me. No, it's not there. Fuck you, Rich Little. Did I have the right guy? Rich Little, he does impressions, you know. Not hard to do. Okay. In the one impression I'd like to do, if I may, Walter Cronkite. Rev, I want to tell you, it's a great pleasure to be here on your behalf tonight. Now, the image that I have is a dignified man, and I never tell dirty stories, but if I can tell this one joke, Rev. And I hope you'll forgive me, because the dirty word, there's only one dirty word, come at the end of the joke. There's cocksuckers walking down the street, see? I want to thank Marvin Gutsagen. Where are you, Marvin? 
you see, they wear all these jokes for me. Red, if you ever need a friend, get a fucking dog. I've known Red a good many years. He has been what we call a national treasure. And God knows, with the passing of a couple of great comedians these past few weeks, we have to treasure every one of these gentlemen. Keep spreading joy in times of tension. I'm glad to be one of them. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Dave. A wonderful telethon. He's telling riddles. Red, you ready? What do you get when you cross a pit bull with a hooker? Your last blowjob. What's the difference between a pussy and a cunt? A pussy is a mound of flesh that is covered with silken hair that you can kiss and caress tremendously. And a cunt is the one that owns it. Our next speaker... Oh, Christ, I miss Killigan's Island. Our next speaker is the producer of this show. His name is Johnny Francis. He's a wonderful man. He is not of our faith, but he has done a lot for the Jews just by not being one. I don't know if you know this, but I've got to tell them, John, is a big Laker fan. Big Laker fan. And uh, the other night we went to the game together, and after the game was over, we went to visit all the Lakers in the dressing room. And besides that, we both had to take a leak. So we walked into the Lakers' toilet, and while we were standing there with our joints in our hand, fishing, James Worthy rushed in and whipped out his pecker, and as Woody started to piss, he said, God, I just made it. And Johnny looked at it and said, see if they can make me one and white. <laughs> Here he is, just for a few words, maybe two. The producer of this evening's show, the Ivan Bosky of fundraisers, John Francis, come up here. Milton for a wonderful fucking telephone. Oh, that's why I heard it. Hi, Red. Hi, pal. God bless you. I'm going to turn it around on you now, Red, right? I first met Red many years ago when I first came to California, and he was walking down Fairfax Avenue, and he wanted to buy a parrot. He was looking for a parrot that would talk to him and kind of keep his eyes out around the house when he wasn't home. And he walked into a little pet shop on Fairfax and the guy said I have just a parrot you want and he took him in the back room and there was a parrot with no legs and he was holding on to the perch with his cock Red said the parrot has no legs the man said that's okay he said this parrot will do just what you want he'll watch he'll talk he'll listen he'll tell you so Red bought the parrot he took it home the next morning he was leaving the house he said to the parrot I want you to keep your eyes open I'm very suspicious of my wife I want you to listen I want you to watch for me the parrot says I'll do it Red came home that night, he walked into the parrot, he said, well, he said, boy, were you right. He said, what happened? He said, you left the house this morning, and all of a sudden he left, there was a knock at the door. He said, and then? He said, a blonde-haired guy with blue eyes, six foot two, walked in. He says, and then? He said, he took all his clothes off. He says, and then? He said, your wife took all her clothes off. He says, and then? He said, then I got a heart on, I fell off the fucking perch. Red was sitting around talking with a couple of his buddies and they were talking about their favorite foods. The first guy says, I like Jewish food. I like Kleplock. I love that. Second guy, he says, I like Chinese food. He said, I like the egg rolls and sweet and sour. I love that stuff. And they turned to Red and they said, how about you, Red? What do you like? Red says, I like pussy. I eat pussy. I eat pussy. He said, it must taste like shit. The guy, he turned to the guy and said, maybe you're taking too big a bite. Well, I come up here to pay my respects to Red. 
Ah, I got him. Don't worry about that. I just want to tell you, Ed, that for a lot of years I've known you, and you've been always nice to me. You've been a gentleman to me. You've been very kind. Everything I've ever asked you to do, you've been there for me. And I appreciate your friendship, and I love you very, very much. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> you are hilarious. Telling jokes. Stick to producing, will you please? <laughs> yeah. You'll eat those words. Our next guest, we got to keep it rolling, because i got to be on the set in December. Our next guest, gentlemen, is one of the most ingenious, talented show business figures in the in show business, and I really mean that. Of course, I'm referring to the one and only Rich Little, who worked very hard to reach stardom. His first job was when he, uh, many years ago, when he was in a carnival, he told me. He used to have women sit on his face, and they, he guessed their weight. And... Um, But this is true, this is true by Rich Little in the Guinness Book of Records. Rich Little holds the world's record for keeping his tongue in a broad snatch for three hours. Unfortunately, after two hours, she had to run for a bus. <laughs> dirty cops. Gentlemen, I think we've had impressionists in the business for a long time, and I've been in the business now. This is my fourth year. <laughs> and in my 77, 78 years in show business, I've seen many impressionists, but I think he is the number one that I've seen in the past 75 years, which little. Gentlemen, in my estimation, Red Buttons is as close to a comic genius as any man who has ever lived, with the possible exception of Joey Bella. His timing, his delivery, his material, unmatched in show business. He's one of a kind. And you know, Red owes it all the food, if you think about it for a minute. Food. Never got a dinner. That's his hook. That's it. Never got a dinner. And if you think about that for a minute, I guess he can't perform anywhere unless they serve food. And if these fires roast from the very beginning were held in the theater instead of where they are here today, we wouldn't be honoring this man here tonight, because, you know, there's nothing funny about saying, never got a ticket, never got a theater, never got a seat. It just doesn't, doesn't quite make it, does it? No, he owes it all to food. And it's a great hook when you think about it. Never got a dinner. I don't know where it ever came from, whether he dreamed it up or what, but it's one of the greatest routines I've ever seen in show business. Never got a dinner. However, with such a great hook as never got a dinner, almost anybody in the world could use it and get laughs, because it's that good. I mean, if Golda Meir had used it, you know, she would have got laughs. Would have been a kosher dinner, but she would have. If she could have used it. Or Walter Cronkite, or Dr. Ruth, or, I mean, Richard Nixon could have used it. He'd still be in power today. I mean, it's that good a hook, never got a dinner. Could you imagine Richard Nixon actually doing Red's bit, never got a dinner? My fellow Americans, do you know that some of the greatest, some of the greatest presidents of all 
time. Never. Never. Got it in him. Some of our greatest presidents. Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. Who said to a hooker at San Juan Hill, Charge! No, Mr. President. For you, it's free. <laughs> Never, never, out of dinner. Good God, I'm having a jowl movement. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, who said to a senator in the washroom of the Capitol building, my God, I was wrong. All men are not created equal. Martha Washington, Martha Washington, who said to George on their wedding night, Jesus Christ, don't go down on me again, you're giving me termite. Never. Got it. You know, it doesn't work quite as well as red. God damn it. A lot of energy. I only get through, do it as you. I've never been able to imitate red buttons. Of course, he can't do himself. But tonight he's ready. Oh my God! I'm telling you, that wiped me out. But you know what? Make you know why Red does that so well. I mean, he's a great comedian. We know that, but he's a great actor too. I mean, this is the thing about Red. We forget he is a brilliant actor. People don't remember an Academy Award winner. As was pointed out earlier, for Sayonara. Do you remember that movie? Do you remember? That was a damn good film. You're right. I'll never forget Sayonara, because I've watched it a million times. Remember the scene in the taxi cab where Brando says to Red, Charlie, Charlie, you should have looked out for me. I was your brother. You should have looked out for me. I could have been somebody. I could have been a contender instead of the bomb that I am today. You should have looked out. You people remember, that's the wrong fucking movie, you idiots. That was on the waterfront. His movie was Sayonara. Jesus, you people don't know your movies. Come on, Sayonara. You remember when Red committed suicide when he saw how good Brando was? You remember that movie. But you know, people do forget that Red really has made a lot of movies. I mean, he's made some classics. Can you name three Red Button movies just like that? Can you name three other than Sayonara? Come on. Come on, I know, I know, I know you. You, you. you can think of a number of them. Right? Right off the top? Uh, no? I was thinking more of Five Weeks in a Balloon. Right? You were thinking of that? Remember that one? Five Weeks in a Balloon with Barbara Eden, Herbert Marshall, Reginald Owen, Peter Lorre. Peter Lorre. Rick, Rick, you've got to help me, Rick. I have to have my teeth up to go out of I stick my neck out for no one. Oh, fuck, that was Captain Blank. All right, another red button movie. And I know, I know, you, as soon as I say the name, you're, you're going to say, oh, of course, God, I forgot he made that. A ticklish affair. A ticklish affair. Don't you people know yet? These people don't know their movies. A ticklish affair. Shirley Jones, Gig Young, Edgar Buchanan. Remember, remember Edgar Buchanan? Sam Sam down there like that played all those Western movies, then ended up on Petticoat Junction. And Sam Sam down there, a ticklish bear. They called it ticklish bear because Red had hair up his ass. These people don't know their movies. All right, one last Red Button is movie. A classic, Up From The Beach. Up From The Beach, right? A classic movie. Cliff Robertson, Slim Pickens, Broderick Crawford, Ten Ford, Ten Ford, Son of Lord Rocks. They don't remember these movies. All right, I'll give you some good ones now. I'll give you some ones that you will remember. How about The Longest Day was referred to. Remember The Longest Day? Now, Red was good in that movie. Do you remember that movie? Where Red uh, ended up hanging from a church on his parachute. Remember that? And then the director called lunch. You remember that? That's why they called it the longest day. Of course, it'd be a long day for you, too, if you had a church steeple up your ass. But now, how about 
uh, Imitation General. Imitation General with Glenn Ford. Glenn Ford, Mr. Excitement. Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Ford. You know, I got a story to tell you about Glenn Ford. This is the honest truth. I've never told this before. Absolutely a true story, not making this up. Years ago, in the 60s, when I first came down from Canada, in the 60s when my beaver died, I did a, a series, uh, a roast. It was a, a, a show by uh, Georgie Jessel did it. It was a, it was, what? Stairway to the Stars. Thank you, Mel. A half hour syndicated show, it was a roast. Every week they roasted somebody and Georgie Jessel was the host. Now this is true. Glenn Ford was going to be roasted one week. And um, everybody got up, they had a rehearsal in the afternoon, and everybody got up and went through their routine. And Guy Marks, bless him, who is not with us any longer, but a beautiful man and, and a funny, funny man too, did his famous, you've probably seen it a hundred times, he did it for 40 years, his Indian routine. Remember that routine where he does Bogart and he does Gary Cooper talking to the Indian chief? And he went through it. Glenn Ford threw a fit. I mean, he went berserk. He grabbed the producer of that show back into the dressing room and said, Now listen, I, I will, not, I will not, not allow that, that man to, to, do, to do that routine. He is out of the show. If he's not, if he's not out of the show, I'm walking. And the producer said, what do you mean? What's the matter? And he said, degrading the Indians. I will not permit this man to degrade our red brothers like that. That, that is just is sacrilegious. And I just, I, just, I just won't have it. And the producer said, well, what the plan is? He's not putting down the Indians. It's a comedy routine. It's a funny routine. Indians have seen it. It's really, it's great. It's not, I mean, don't take it so. I will not permit that. If he does that, that routine, degrades the Indians like that, I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm walking right off the show. That's it. I'm finished. I'm, 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 just, I'm just not going to do it. And so the producer looked at him and he thought, well, then he thought, my God. And he looked at Glenn and he said, well, Glenn, to be all honest, in many of your westerns, you killed Indians. And Glenn went, yes. Yes. But I use blanks. Now, I know it isn't terribly funny, but I fell on the floor with that. And if you know Glenn, it even is funnier, right, Red? Because Glenn is a nice man, but not too swift. John Wayne actually played in that movie, if you've ever seen it on the late show, Genghis Khan. And there's a great scene, I'm going to end with this. There's a great scene in that movie where John Wayne says, <laughs> All right, listen and listen tight, fellow mongrels. Tomorrow we're, we're going to take the town of Orca again. That's right. It's Orca time. Now remember, Jesus Christ, when we get to that town, I don't want you to make the same mistake we made last year. So let's go over the plan one more time and get it and get it right. When we get to Orca, I want you to kill the men, rape the women, and round up the sheep. Jesus Christ, let's get it right this time. <laughs> Thank you, Rich, for coming here to honor Red. God bless you. Our next speaker, we got to move. Our next speaker is Jesse White, and he's been a pal of mine for over a half a century. So you can see he's putting on a little mileage. The hell so am I. When I was born, the wonder drug was Mercurochrome. <laughs> Gentlemen, you, you know, you can tell you're getting old when you're sitting in a bathtub with two inches of water in it and your balls start to float. 
I want a warm reception for one of Red's dearest friends and mine too, one of the great storytellers, Jesse White. Thank you, thank you, Milton. I, uh, in the immortal words of Dan Quayle, who said, if at first you don't succeed, maybe skydiving isn't for you. <laughs> Do you know why blind people don't make good skydivers? It scares the shit out of their dogs. <laughs> I heard a cute story, I have to tell it before I forget it. The Polish University was playing Lithuania for the championship. The star quarterback of the Polish team wasn't allowed to play because he flunked a couple of tests. And the crowd, 50,000 Polacks in the stands, hollering, we want Stosh! We want Stosh! Carrying on, 50,000. Finally, the dean of the college gets on, he says, Stosh cannot play, he failed three tests. We want Stosh! He said, all right, I'll tell you what, I'll ask him a question, if he can answer it, I'll let him play. They say, what well, wonderful. He says to Stosh, how much is four plus two? Stosh thinks a second, he says six. Without the crowd in a, in a, in a body, get up and they holler, give him another chance. <laughs> I was glad to see the, um, that you're going to honor the, the Lakers and in honor of Sidney Poitier, I have to tell you a story. I went with a friend of mine also to the, one of the basketball games, he and his teenage son. And we went back in the locker room just as Magic Johnson was stepping out of a shower. And he had a schlong though. And the kid looks at him, he can't get over it. He's, my God, Mr. Johnson. You have the most beautiful, biggest penis I've ever seen. I wish I had one like that. He said, well, you could have one. He said, how? He said, get a brick. Tie a piece of rope around it and tie it to the end of your cock. In six weeks, you'll have one just like mine. Kid comes back in two weeks. He said, well, how are you doing? He said, fine. He says, is your little cock any longer? He said, no, but it's starting to turn black. Sidney loved him. <laughs> Red buttons, God bless him. Speaking, just to digress for a moment, that cocksucker Hussein is really nuts. They say he's holding 500 American lawyers hostage. And if Bush don't give in to his demands, he's going to release one every three hours. <laughs> Red, when he was younger, met a, met a girl, a daughter of a wealthy, very wealthy man, and the girl was so ugly. Ugly. I'm talking ugly. And she couldn't get it. Finally, she met Red somewhere at a picnic, and she comes home and tells her father, she says, I finally met a wonderful boy, Red Buttons. He's crazy about me. He said, no, no, he's crazy about my money. No, honest to God, Papa, he said he loves me. He said, bring him over here, I'd like to talk to him. Brings him over, he says, you in love with my daughter? He says, oh, yes, sir. I love her very much. He said, let me ask you something. He said, if you found $100, what would you do with it? Red says, well, sir, I would read the Iguana ads in the paper they would lost and found, or I'd put an ad in the paper and I'd wait 30 days. If nobody claimed it, I'd take it to the bank and deposit it. it was very good. What would you do if you found a million dollars? Well, the same thing, sir. I'd try to find out who the owner is. I'd put an ad in the paper, and I'd wait 30 days. And he says, 
If nobody claimed it, you and your daughter can go fuck yourself. <laughs> Red used to ball a little oriental girl. Beautiful girl, and he's humping her one night, and she farts. And Red said, what was that? And she said, front hole so happy, back hole holler hooray. <laughs> now the daughter of a wealthy Japanese family was sent to college, UCLA. She went home for a vacation and a father, an honorable father, would like to speak to honorable daughter. Come with me. Takes her in a room. She said, what is it, honorable father? He says, word has reached honorable father that daughter has been seeing a black boy and a Jewish boy. She says, oh, honorable father, what motherfucker told you that boba mindset? <laughs> Red took his little poodle to a veterinarian and he's sitting there and a woman comes in with a big Great Dane dog. And she looks at Red and she says, what's the matter with your poodle? She says, I don't know what the hell's the matter with me. He's so goddamn horny. I, I'm so embarrassed that people come over to visit me. The first thing he jumps on her leg and tries to fuck their leg and their, their arms and I'm so embarrassed. I'm going to have him neutered. What about your Great Dane? She says, same thing. He's so goddamn horny. I'm on the kitchen floor washing the floor. He jumps on me and tries to hump me. And he's giving it to me. I'm washing this. He jumps on me and tries to fuck me. It's embarrassing. Red says, are you going to have him fixed? She said, no, I'm just going to have his nails trimmed. Jewish woman sitting on a bench sunning herself and another lady a little Irish lady sits down next to her and they get to talk they're talking and the little Irish woman says uh, how are you she said I'm fine thank you she and they talk and she said do you have any kind of a social life a little Jewish woman said yeah I have a nice fella boyfriend she said, what do you do for excitement she said, well we go I make him dinner we have a little wine and we dance a little and we go to bed and take off our clothes and get in bed and we sing some nice Jewish songs and we turn over and go to sleep. She said, really? She said, how about you? Do you have a social life? She says, oh yes indeed. I have a nice boyfriend. He comes over, we have dinner and a little wine, a little Irish whiskey and we go up and get naked and we get in bed. She said, I don't know too many Jewish songs, so we just fuck all night. <laughs> Red was driving along Sunset Boulevard one night, and a little nun was waiting for a bus. And Red, she was adorable. And Red stopped and says, can I give you a lift, sister? She says, oh, thank you. She gets in a car, they're driving along, and Red looks at her and he says, you're very pretty. You're very beautiful in there. That, that little outfit you're wearing really turns me on. She says, are you a Catholic? He says, yes. And she gives him one of the greatest blowjobs he ever had. And after he's finished, he says to her, he says, sister, I have to be honest with you. I'm not Catholic. And the nun says, well, I have to be honest with you. I'm not Catholic either. My name is Ralph and I'm going to a masquerade party. An old man goes to his lawyer and he says, what can I do for you? He says, I want a divorce. 35, 35 years is enough. He said, well, do you have grounds? He said, yes, I have two lots in Palm Springs. And now he says, no, no. Do you have cars? He said, yes, I have three cars, a Cadillac, a Lincoln. He said, no, no. He said, do you have a grudge? He said, where do you think I keep the cars? He said, no, no. He says, 
Are you a nagger? Is she a nagger? She said, no, she's white, but she's fucking a nagger. That's why I want a divorce. <laughs> is he laughing? I love you. This is a story about the Pope. Very, it's not sacrilegious. It's, he wanted to redo, redecorate his headquarters. Calls in a little Polish contractor, tells him what he wants. He says, Stash, how much? He says, Holy Father, $900. He says, how do you figure? He says, 300 for labor, 300 for material, 300 for me. He says, I'll let you know. Next day he calls in a, an Italian contractor. How much? He says, well, your holiness, for you, $1,800. He says, how do you figure? He says, 600 for material, 600 for labor, 600 for me. He says, I'll let you know. Next day he calls a little Jewish contractor. He tells him what he wants. He says, Sal, how much? He says, well, the Holy Father, for you, 2700 He says, how do you figure? He says, 900 My Polish man wanted 900 my Italian friend wanted 1800 How do you figure 2700 He's 900 for me, 900 for you, and we give the job to the Polak. <laughs> Red, God bless you. I love you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Gentlemen, how do you describe a Norm Crosby? Talented? Yes. Funny? Yes. Creative? Yes. Working? No. I'm kidding. This guy is always working, in addition to uh, appearing every, every night in the year, especially doing so many benefits. This guy has a lifetime contract as the representative of Anheuser-Busch. I know how he got the job by kissing and Isis Bush. Gentlemen, here he is, a little late, but he's a guy that you go on next to closing and kill him. He's known as the mangler of the English language, Mr. Malaprop, Norm Crosby, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know it's getting late in the evening, and I know a lot of you have uh, other appointments. But I am especially delighted to be able to pay tribute to one of the four great Reds in show business. We have Red Skelton, Red Fox, Red Buttons, and of course, uh, Red Yiddish. Red Buttons is a paradox. He's a charming, soft-spoken, very polite gentleman. And yet, in his acting, in his comedy, he's a powerhouse, a dynamo. Kind of reminds me of the big tough guy that walked into a bar on the east side of New York with his hands like this, and he said, Hey, I'll blow any guy in this room who could tell me what I got in my hands. Some drunk at the bar said, you got the Concord Hotel. The tough guy said, it looks like we have a winner. <laughs> Red is a very devoted family man, even when he's on the road. I want Adam to know that. And yet one time I heard him, just maybe out of curiosity, ask a hooker in Las Vegas. He said, how much do you charge? to massage the genitals, and the girl said, same as the Jews, I don't give a shit. <laughs> Red is a very knowledgeable man, he reads a lot, he remembers things, he knows a lot of things that most people don't know. He knows the similarity between Eggs Benedict and a blowjob, that you kind of never seem to get him at home. He knows why Canadian couples like the fuck doggy style. So they can both watch the hockey game.
He knows the difference between spaghetti and a Jewish American princess. Spaghetti moves when you eat it. He knows why women don't get AIDS. They don't marry assholes, they fuck them. What do I say? Exactly. They don't fuck assholes, they marry them. I said it backwards. That fucking Milton put me on at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. How can I remember my own man? <laughs> I said it backwards. He knows everything about sports. He knows all the statistics, all the little things that people don't remember. I was with Red once at an ABC sports banquet and they were asking questions. He almost won. Honest to God. They asked, who hit the most home runs? And immediately Red said, Hank Aaron. They said, that is right. They asked, who stole the most bases? Red jumped up, he said, Lou Brock. They said, that is correct. And then they asked, who got hit in the face with the most balls? And immediately he jumped up and said, Shelly Wentes? Everyone knows that Red is very fussy with his food. That's legendary. But I happen to know two things that Red really loves to eat. Pussy and fruit. He is probably the only man in our business who could simultaneously eat common Miranda's cunt and hat. Red is a very charitable man. He is always doing good things for good causes. I have never, I don't think, ever been to a banquet or a function for a noble cause uh, that Red wasn't on the dais and, and, and helping. Last month, as a matter of fact, he spent a lot of time raising money for a gay church in Santa Monica. Our Lady of Perpetual Ointment. Now, for those of you who don't know, a gay church is very much like a regular church, except that every other person is kneeling. <laughs> you know, I, I... I must tell you something. We, we, everybody's doing jokes. The Home for the Aged is a, is a magnificent institution, and it's good that we can be here to help. I was at a function for Home for the Aged in Miami not long ago and a little lady sat down beside a man who was watching the TV and she said to him, Luke, how pale you are. Luke, you don't have no tan. Luke, Miami in the sunshine, you don't have no tan. And I said, lady, please, I just got out of prison. She said, how long you was in prison? He said, 20 years. She said, my God, what did you do? They put you 20 years in prison. He said, you want to know what I did? I took an ax, a fucking ax, and I chopped my wife up in little pieces. And she said, oh, you're single. <laughs> I, I have to tell a story. I'm sure he's such, he's read, read, somebody at the very beginning of this evening said that Red is a comedy genius. He is. His, his sense of timing, his, his, his thoughts are incredibly funny. We, we had a luncheon one day at Buddy Hackett's house. Buddy Hackett, maybe every two or three times a year, has a luncheon and invites only comics. Only comedians, only comedy actors, and there was a gang. George Burns was there, Milton was there, uh, Jan, Red, uh, everybody. Uh, Shecky, uh, the whole, jo uh, uh, Danny Thomas, may his soul rest in peace, everybody was there. And Buddy, during the luncheon, there were about 25 of us, during the luncheon, Buddy stood up at the table and he said, uh, I'd like to say something here. He said, my wife Sherry, and I don't do impressions, but Buddy said, my wife Sherry is starting a suicide prevention hotline, which she really was, because my wife Joni was helping her, and Alicia, and, and Tony Murray, and all the ladies, and uh, he said, we're, we're going to start up a suicide hotline where people can call that are disturbed and, and uh, get advice. And uh, all of you here will be asked, I'm sure, to take part in a benefit or perhaps give money or even uh, give up um, an item or something for a celebrity auction. And it's not mandatory that anybody should do it, 
but I just want to say that when they call you, I want you to know that it's my wife's organization. And Rick jumped up and said, buddy, you know, I love you, and I love Sherry, but I just joined a group called Fuck Them, Let Them Die. <laughs> you remember that? No, we, we're, we're a little pressed for time here, and I'm not going to stay on too long, but I just want to say one thing. He's a kind man. He cares. Red, somebody mentioned earlier about his dog. Red had a, a pit bull that was uh, biting everybody. Bit the mailman, bit the pool man, bit the gardener, bit everybody on the street. And finally, the police came to his house, and they said, Red, we, we come here to take the dog. We have to put the dog away. And we're fans of yours, and we love you, and we, geez, we really hate to do this. You do have an alternative. If you could take the dog to the vet and have him castrated, we'll let you keep the dog, because that takes kind of the hate out of the dog. And Red said, geez, I love the dog. I don't want to have him put away. I'll do that. So the very next morning, he put a leash on the dog. He was dragging the dog out to the vet. And a little old man came walking up the street, probably from the home from the aged, a little old man, you know, bent over, shriveled up little old, uh, pukey old man, scroungy old, little old, pukey old man came walking up the street and the dog jumped on him, bit the cane in half, threw the guy down, started biting at his clothes, ripping at him, and Red pulled the dog off, tied him to a fence, he went back, he helped the guy up, he said, geez, I'm sorry, he said, look, I'm Red Buttons, I, my dog, he said, I, I, I can't tell you how sorry I am, look, go get a new suit, get a new cane, whatever you need, I'll pay for it, please, and if it's any consolation to you at all, just know that I am taking this dog right now to the vet to have him castrated. And the old man said, castrated, but he should take his teeth out. I knew right away he wasn't trying to fuck me. All right. Okay, okay, okay. Red will be right back. Wait, 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 sit down. Sit, Milton, I'll take care of it. Uh, me? Okay. I, I want to tell you something. Now that he's gone, I can say this. I, I owe Red an apology. And I'm not ashamed to make it publicly in front of everybody because uh, it's been a long time. But like many others, I always believe that Red had kind of a superior attitude, uh, a constant smirk, perhaps, of of scorn and disdain. And I resented that a little bit. It bothered me. And just recently, I was talking to Phil Rosenthal, who is Red's very dear friend, and I found out that Red suffers from perpetual and constant diarrhea. And gentlemen, it turns out that what most people take to be an expression of smug arrogance is in reality a sincere and honest effort to keep from shitting in his pants. And I'm not ashamed to say that I was wrong. And I'm just going to keep talking until Red comes back, so fuck you. If you. It doesn't make any difference. It's not going to be funny stuff. It'll just do the time. That's why we're here. Just to, So the old people in the home won't know that we broke up early. They don't care. They're probably all watching TV now. And, finger fucking whatever they do in the house. Um, Red is an international star, an Academy Award winner. He told me that a couple of years ago at the Cannes Film Festival, he was talking with some producers from all over the world, We're talking about show business, about personal lives, about being on the road and coming home. How do you mix with all this movie starlets and at the same time satisfy your own wife? How do you please your wife? How do you make your wife get excited and scream? And the French producer said, I am a way. When I come home, I take my wife, I lie her on the bed, I take some brie cheese, some champagne, French champagne. I sprinkle brie cheese on here. I splash the champagne. Then I nibble the cheese, I lick the champagne, and when I get down to Le Belle Bonton, she excited, when I get to Le Schmippet, she scream, she scream. 
and the Japanese producer said, so, no, I do something else. I take sushi and sake, and I put on my wife sushi and sake, and I lotus blossom, and I bite the sushi, bite the sake, and eat the sake, blow the lotus blossom all the way down Nippu West to Celestial Valley of Heavenly Bliss, and she screamed, she screamed. And I said, well, that's great, you know, that's, that's terrific. He said, but I don't do that. He said, my wife and I have been married a long time. We understand each other. He said, I come home from the studio sometimes. I'm hot, I'm sweaty. I don't even wash up. I take my wife upstairs and I give her a fuck. I give her a good fuck. Then I get up and I wipe my cock on her drapes. You want to hear a woman scream? <laughs> Gentlemen, this is all contrived stuff. What I really came here tonight to say was that Red Buttons is a very, very special guy. He's a special friend. He's a tremendous talent, and I am very pleased to be here to honor him. Thank you very much. Beautiful Norm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give that spot to a leopard that you were in. And gentlemen, now it's time for the pièce de résistance, a great comedian who can, we always can depend upon this man whenever there's a humanitarian cause, a worthy charity benefit, Red Buttons is there. A good deed to be done. This man is always there, always there. Gentlemen, our guest of honor, Red Buttons. I got in there and I couldn't piss. <laughs> I swear to you, sitting here, it was like burning the right acid. Oh my God, you know, because we've been here since what? Fish above? <laughs> I ran in and forget it. Milton, Milton, God bless you. No, God bless you. Beautiful, w wonderful man. I'm talking about a man man with heart, a man who recently said to Michael Dukakis, four more years. <laughs> God bless you, Milton. God bless you. Good man. man who was once pulled out of a burning car and then thrown back in again. <laughs> God bless you, Milton. He's a good man, Donald. He's a good man. He recently sent a video of Home Alone to Salman Rushdie. <laughs> God, God, God bless you, Milton. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Gentlemen, this is the Chinese year of the ram, and also the Jewish year of the schmuck. And I am the schmuck that was chosen this year to be honored by the guardians, philanthropic and civic-minded group of men who have dedicated themselves to patrolling the corridors of Cedar Sinai to help prevent some little Beverly Hills pricks from pulling the plug on the life support of their grandparents. <laughs> Who've left them the whole Geschichte, everything, the cash, the stocks, the bonds, the whole thing. 
this these good men, the guardians do, in the name of sweet charity. Occasionally one of them will wind up with a blowjob from a, a nurse in the intensive care unit who's on the graveyard shift. And justly so. One guardian was rumored to have pumped a pacemaker patient just to test the equipment. It's the kind of work they do. They also have coordinated, I don't know if you folks know this, they coordinated their efforts with the Beverly Hills Fire Department. Every week, uh, one idiot is chosen to yell false alarm. Uh, when the, um, yes, when the smoke detector goes off in an iron lung. God bless you, the guardians, for honoring me. I tell you, I haven't been this thrilled since Ed Ames went down to the home and sang, Try to Remember. Ed Ames is a brilliant man. Everybody's looking for Elvis. He's looking for Art Linkletter. In February of 1946, I was discharged out of the Air Corps after returning from Germany, where I was affectionately known among the hooker fraternity in Wiesbaden as their clan of putts. <laughs> Milton at that time was known as the grosser putts. A hunk of art that could have hung in the Louvre. Or at the very least in the window of the stage delicatessen. Where it could have kept his tongue company which was, which served as a landing field for kosher flies. Milton had the only putts in the world with a miniature Lionel electric train running on it. And that train today, ladies and gentlemen, is on loan out, and you can see it running around the ceiling at Mateo's. Milton has had his putts into many strange holes, including a porcupine in the Catskills. In the summer of 48 he did this, and at one time his putts had more needle holes than Sonny Von Bulo. This is all smart shit, Milton. In 1946, Milton asked me to join the Friars in New York because Milton was the Friars in New York. I got in on the GI Veterans Program which was 50 bucks and the opportunity to watch Milton take a piss in the men's room. I joined. I watched him piss and I took a ride on the train. <laughs> smart, smart shit, smart, smart. I did my first Flyers Roast in 1946. 45 years ago, we roasted, you'll be happy to know Sidney, my dear friend, we roasted Pegleg Bates, who was down on his luck. And the money we raised helped put him back on his foot. <laughs> smart, smart shit, smart, watch your father, watch your father, smart stuff. This month, Milton, it's my 45th anniversary, Jan, my 45th anniversary of doing this dreck at these stairs. I hate to repeat myself, Milton, and I, I know you feel the same way. I'd like to recall some of the shit I have come up with during all these years. I've just taken a little sample here, a little thing there, because I'm being on it tonight and I feel that this is a culmination of 45 years of real shit, Milton. Thank you, cameo, cameo shit, that's good. 
And yes, Milton, I was there. Always there. You call me, Jan, you know that. John, you know that. All the guys, you know that. You call me, and I am there. And over in New York, at an election day victory party of Italian hookers known as cocksuckers for Cuomo. <laughs> I was there. I was cocking, I was sucking, I was crowing. I was there. I was there, Milton. In Hollywood, at a Richard Simmons bend over and touch your toes, and you could be in for a big surprise exercise class. I was there, I was bending, I was touching, I was throwing. I was surprised! I was there, Sydney. So let us say the Latin. I was there. In Haig Ashbury, at a joyous gathering of gay Hasidic pickpockets, who after they lift your wallet, grab your bowls, and dive in Minchin and Marlin. I was davening, I was minching, I was marveling, I was mocking, I was there. That's why I'm here tonight, being honored with this prestigious honor. At a polo lounge luncheon of rich Beverly Hills Yentis, who will only douche with Perrier, because their husbands like the taste of benzene. I was there, I was tasting, I was pairing, I was aiming. I was benzing, I was zinging, I was there. In Kuwait City, at a grab an Iraqi and fuck him in the ass festival. I was there, I just got back, Milton, I just arrived. I grabbed an Iraqi, I bought them. In Berlin, during stick your dick in the wall and make a wish day, I was sticking, I was wishing, I was walling, but I was there, Milton. God damn right, I did that to get my heart started. In Transylvania, at a midnight minion of gay kosher vampires who will not let the putts unless they salt it first. I was trancing, I was veining. I was meaning I was there. That's why I'm here tonight. In Greenwich Village, my good friends, at a convention of cocksuckers, not guys who are gay, guys who are just plain cocksuckers. I was there, I was tucking, I was sucking. I was gringing, I was villaging. And I was there, Milton. God bless you, Milton. Never light a cigar when a master is on you. At a Warren Beatty cum spill in Malibu Beach. I was coming, Sydney, I was spilling, I was beaching. I was there. In Miami, at a mass hysterectomy of kosher chickens. By Hadassah housewives who believe that the clitoris spoils the soup. I was hissing, I was wrecking, I was there, Philip, I was there. Our dear chairman of the board of TV Fanfare, God bless you. In Louisville, at the Kentucky Fried Chicken Medical School for Gynecologists, who find it finger looking good. I was licking, I was gooding, I was fingering, I was there, Milton. Milton, I was there. In the Congo, at a cookout of gay cannibals who really have to trust each other. <laughs> Hanging, cooking. There. In the Gdansk, Poland, when a gay striking shipyard worker tried to wreck Walesa. Smart shit, Milton, smart. I was there, I was lacking, I was lacking, I was there. 
Pittsburgh at a small cocktail party for premature. It was done. In Detroit at the annual Fuck Japan Parade. Short, concise, Bill. Short, concise, sweet, boom. Thrust home. I was there. In Holland, I stuck my finger in a dike and she kicked me in the balls. <laughs> Never were my goodies that made a living for a few of the boys. I was there. What else? Must be a few places here. Something? All right. And I was at all these places. Tonight, Milton and Johnny, thank you through your auspices and generous, you know, choosing me as the guest of honor. I got a dinner. Finally got a dinner. Here's just a few, few and little steak. Few and little. Just a few here and there, maybe a couple of newies, a few oldies, and we'll all go home. It's been a beautiful night. Boy George, you said to Sinead O'Connor, need some place to shove that Grammy? <laughs> never. Never get a dinner. The fair Roxanne, who said to Cyrano de Bergerac, I don't care what it is, put a condom on it. Never, Sydney. You're watching a master at work now, Sydney. Lee Ida Coker, the first man to fuck an airbag at 40 miles an hour. Or was it 50? Who knows? Never got it done. John Collins, who said you meet the same pricks on the way up as you do on the way down. Never got it done. Making a few judicious cuts. No Millie Vanilli, you said to George Bush, read our fucking lips. <laughs> a winner. Never got a dinner. Kevin Costner, who dances with wolves and fucks sheep. <laughs> what do you want from me? Sidney Poitier. Sidney Poitier. Sidney Poitier, who said to Lester Maddox, guess who the fuck is not coming to dinner? <laughs> Wrote that while I was sitting there, so help me God. This is what this stuff looks like, this is the new stuff. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher's husband, who said to Margaret, I can't get it in, your bulls are in the way. Get Truffin. Roger and me. Not the movie. Just two guys who are sucking each other off in a General Motors car. Never got a dinner. Ray Charles, who said to Stevie Wonder, show me the motherfucker who told you you're white. Never got a dinner done. The invisible man's mother who said to invisible, I know you're jerking off, I can feel the breeze. <laughs> Never got a dinner drunk. <laughs> Captain Kirk who said to Mr. Spock, bend over, I want to go where no man has gone before. <laughs> a biggie. Love you, Donald. Mae West, who was fed through a cock in the intensive care unit. I'll give you a moment. Roseanne Barr's husband, who said to Roseanne on their wedding night, sit on your own face. Never. Never got a dinner. I am honored. I am honored. Jeff, I am honored, my boy. King Henry VIII, who said to Anne Boleyn, you cunt, you want a separation? You got it.
never said he. Captain Hook, the only man who ever jerked off with his wrist. <laughs> Sit around all day writing this shit. <laughs> Washington who yelled while crossing the Delaware, no pissing till we hit Jersey. <laughs> Never got a dinner. By golly, the biggest. Linda Lovelace who said to King Kong, don't mention it. speaker's wife who said on a wedding night just to tip O'Neill. <laughs> Never got a dinner, just picking out stuff at random. Dracula's girlfriend who said to Dracula, I just got my period, La Chaim. who said at the opening of Cats, Ich, pussy. <laughs> Jimmy Swaggart. Jimmy Swaggart who said, <laughs> Yes, yes, it's true. I got laid, I got my dick lips in my balls. <laughs> I ain't a pussy, and I would do it all over again if you said not to. <laughs> Send money, those cunts are expensive. <laughs> Jesus. I am proud. I am truly proud. To have been part of this Michigas this craziness the past 45 years. Knowing, knowing that every time I said the word cocksucker, prick, fog, cunt, asshole, that some old lady in a nursing home or a handicapped person in a hospital <laughs> was getting just a little bit more than the ordinary would have gotten. I was a small cog in that machine. The machine is up here tonight and some of the guys that are missing. We've raised millions of dollars, millions, many, many millions for these worthy causes because they come to show business, as you know. And we're here, and we help. But we can't do it, and it would be meaningless without you guys out front who get into your pocketbooks, who come, who laugh at this, who appreciate our nonsense, and help to keep a magnificent, wonderful edifice like the Jewish Home for the Aging running and alive because who knows maybe one day we'll be there there'll be a new set of guys in the machine thank you for asking me god bless you